Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. As most of you know by now, after these years of this program being on air, I'm also known in El Paso as Uncle Sam. Now today I'm not wearing my full dress uniform as Uncle Sam, I'm wearing the informal outfit of Uncle Sam. Today I have some wonderful guests from the organization known as the Vietnam Veterans of America. And before I introduce them, I'm going to read just a little bit of something from a book that I brought with me, War Letters. And some of these letters from this book around 2001 are from the war in Vietnam. As you notice, I brought a mailbox here for today. And I want to read just a little bit of a letter that was written to President John F. Kennedy by a woman named Bobby Lou Pendergrass, whose brother, James McAndrew, had been killed in Vietnam in the very early days of that war. And she writes to President Kennedy and she asks him this question. I can't help but feel that giving one's life for one's country is one thing, but being sent to a country where half of our country never even heard of it and being shot at without even a chance to shoot back is another thing altogether. Please, I'm only a housewife who doesn't even claim to know all about the international situation, but we have felt so bitter over this. Can the small number of our boys over in Vietnam possibly be doing enough good to justify the awful number of casualties? It seems to me that if we're going to have our boys over there, that we should send enough to have a chance or else stay home. Those fellows are just sitting ducks in those darn helicopters. If a war is worth fighting, isn't it worth fighting to win? Please answer this and help me and my family to reconcile ourselves to our loss and to feel that even though Jim died in Vietnam, and it isn't our war, it wasn't in vain. And John F. Kennedy writes back to her and he says something along the line of this. Americans are in Vietnam because we have determined that this country must not fall under communist domination. Ever since Vietnam was divided, the Vietnamese have fought valiantly to maintain their independence in the face of the continuing threat from the North. Shortly after the division eight years ago, it became apparent that they could not be successful in their defense without extensive assistance from other nations of the free world community. If Vietnam should fall, it will indicate to the people of Southeast Asia that complete communist domination of their part of the world is almost inevitable. Your brother was in Vietnam because the threat to the Vietnamese people is, in the long run, a threat to the free world, the whole community, and ultimately a threat to us all. For when freedom is destroyed in one country, it is threatened throughout the world. My special guests are Harry Nelson and John Hanway. Hanway. John Hanway. I've just met John. I met Harry the other day at an event with the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And you went to Vietnam and you are associated now with the Vietnam Veterans of America. Did that bring back some memories? Wasn't that what you were told when you went to fight in Vietnam? And did you join or were you drafted? Let's start with you, Harry. I volunteered for the Navy. And the next thing I was in country. They needed people with my education of the Navy. Mm -hmm. I was known as an aviation ordinance man. So you spent more time in the air than on the water? I was on land. I never was on water that first year I was there. We flew gunships. Okay. We were known as the Sea Wolves. We were based out of Bintui, and we would fly as far as maybe 300 miles out and almost reaching the Cambodia border and back to Bintui and in that area. Sometimes we stay at places overnight. But that was our, our mission. We never knew where we were going. We just go as what they told us. As I received my draft notice and they took care of it, you know, it was. It was reality. I was so glad to come home. I After I got home, about two more months later, they sent me back out again to Vietnam. But on that time, I was on a carrier, and we were off the coast of Vietnam looking for submarines to make sure they wouldn't come in inland. I didn't think about that when I was in country, but I knew what was going on in country when I was out at sea. And it's, it's, it brings back quite a lot, just listening to you about helicopters, and the fighting that's going on then, it was, it was chaos. I had a brother-in-law, he eventually died of Agent Orange that was being sprayed on the troops in Vietnam and he was on some kind of gunboat uh, while he was in Vietnam, he was on the water. 
Now, John, what about your experience? Were you drafted? Did you join? And what kind of operations were you involved in? Uh, I volunteered. Uh, I didn't volunteer for Vietnam. I pulled the tour in Panama first, mm -hmm. got me acclimated and ready to go. I came back and they sent me directly to Vietnam on the first trip. Uh, we was in uh, the Third Corps area, which is runs from Saigon to the Cambodian border. Uh, we run search and destroy missions, uh, set up ambushes. Uh, we got into some things that's called pacification, where we try to make the people in the area happy so that they'll have something good for us, you know, to say to us. And you meet, you meet a lot of people when you go over there. You got a lot of different opinions from people that come. Uh, you take them with a grain of salt and listen to them. They might not be the same as yours, but you know, everybody's got their right, and that's why we were there anyway, to stand up for freedom. Yeah, exactly. Now, then, uh, most people in today's time in El Paso may not realize that El Paso Community College, this location, uh, this school, started filled with veterans coming back from Vietnam. As I went to my classes, most of them, I think 70% of our student population in 1972 when I started teaching here, uh, about 70% of our population were students coming back from Vietnam and going to school on GI money. Did either of you take advantage of that um, and take some classes on some money when you came back from Vietnam? When I came home, I, I did go to a college to try, but I realized my mind was on other things. I couldn't get them out of my dreams. I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep. Everything was, was a, it was confusion. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe I was home. So I didn't, I didn't continue with the college. I just stayed where I worked. And, you know, meeting a lot of veterans who had came back, you know, it, it was, it was reality. We're home. It was hard to believe that. Right. That you survived it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what we might call post-traumatic stress syndrome. You were going through wrestling with all of those. And some of the veterans that were at the program the other day with the VFW are still struggling with their experiences in Vietnam or Korea or Iraq or Afghanistan. There's no doubt about it. Uh, what about you, John? What did you do when you came back? Well, I was medevac back. I had uh, 12 days left till it was time for me to leave anyway, but I got injured in a roadside uh, accident that took place and the jeep turned over on us and the uh, little guys fired their shots and left. Uh, I came back and, and was hospitalized for about seven months and I was down in Fort Hood and they released me from the hospital. I went back to a unit and Lord and behold I'm on orders to go back again for the second time. Mm -hmm. I went back to the same battalion just a different company uh, the atmosphere was a little bit different the second year. Even though we were tracing through the same mud and grits and all that other stuff as we did the first year I was there, uh, it didn't seem like a lot of progress was made. You brought up the issue of PTSD and I'd like to expound on that for okay, just a second. Okay. A lot of people that have PTSD want to find a blame other than admitting that they have something wrong with them. And to get the help that they realize, you know, that something's happening and it's causing distrust in their families and with friends and things like that, uh, they need to seek help. And one of the organizations is the Vietnam Veterans, and we don't push the agenda. You can come and you can be with friends that went through the same things you did. Yeah. We have three veteran service order, uh, uh, counselors that are available to talk to anybody. It costs them absolutely nothing and guides them in the right direction for help with the VA and one thing or another like that. But the realization of PTSD is something that has to be admitted by the people that have it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to come to that realization. If you don't, uh, you'll go on and you'll have these fits of anger, you'll have sleepless nights, you'll have everything that comes with it. Once you s seek the help, and you get an understanding somewhat, you'll never probably understand the whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, then you'll feel better about yourself, you'll feel better about the people you're with. Myself, 
used to be three was a crowd. I couldn't be with three people. Now it doesn't bother me. If there's 100, 200, 300, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I can get through that. But I admitted to myself that I had the problem and I got the help that I needed by way of the VA and then uh, one of the places that's not too far from here, right down the street, the vet center. Uh, the, the tremendous support for veterans. Mm -hmm. I would encourage anybody that's out there that has an inkling that they have PTSD or maybe thinking about it, they have fits of anger, lack of sleep, uh, a multitude of things, that they come and they see one of our veteran service officers and let them guide them in the right direction to get started on this. It's a heck of a thing to have PTSD. You, you know you have something, but you don't know what it is mm -hmm. until somebody hits the nail on the head. Then you can come to the realization and you can get over it. Or not over it, you'll get better with it. Well, you told me before we started this taping that you're membership chairman for this organization. Yes, here. I am. And you brought some material to share with us. We want you to share a telephone number so they can get in touch with you if they want to join your organization or get the very help you're talking about. Okay, uh, my membership card uh, has got all the information that's listed on there. My home phone number is 593-8151. My cell phone number is 234-6663. Now you brought some materials and I'm going to get my co-producer, Marco Lara, to weave some of these into the show okay. uh, for this discussion. So you have a pamphlet. The pamphlet explains the VVA and there's a membership in the back. Uh, it, it gives people a better idea of what we're doing. We're not just there as for the veterans. We're here for the community as well. Okay. Now we have an endowment with the community college. We also have an endowment with UTEP. And the priority goes to veterans, veterans' kids, spouses, that type of thing, and then other kids that uh, are in need of uh, assistance. And then you have a little pamphlet here. What is this? This is our weekly magazine. It's no longer printed in the hard copy or very little in the, the hard copies. And it passes information along to the people. There's places in here. You'll see letters from the president, from the vice president, which Harry Nelson is our vice president, uh, from the chaplain, and just general information that comes by way of um, maybe the VA or somebody else. Things that are happening. Things that are happening, changes and things like that where we can, you know, pass that along to people. Uh, not only are we a, a camaraderie organization, we help the community. We have several places that we donate to. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the two already, the two universities. Right. Uh, but uh, like candle lighters that take care of the little uh, uh, cancer-stricken victims, mm -hmm. and we also do their deliveries on uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, their baskets. We do that on a volunteer basis. Uh, Alawa Elementary School is downtown. You know, they're the, about the poorest na uh, neighborhood around, and we support them. So you're a service organization. Oh, right? yes. Service we, uh, to the services, if, if people come to us with a service orientation, the, we can help. That's all we ask. Okay. And give us enough time to work on it, not just come in, I need it right now, type thing, because that, that, that doesn't take time. <laughs> we will honor the request that we get. We have sponsors is out there that does a lot for the kids in El Paso. Price is cream here is one. Mm -hmm. Every time we have a get together with the kids, they furnish the ice creams and the drinks and, and all of that. You know, so they give back to us too. We're good. Well, we want to thank you for your service to this country. There's no doubt about that, both of you. Harry I thank you for giving us this opportunity to mm -hmm. speak. Sometimes uh, someone will ask me this question. I know I'm interjecting myself into the interview. It's really your show, but since you're with the Vietnam veterans, Sometimes someone will ask me, what's the most meaningful thing you've ever done as Uncle Sam? You've done lots of programs. I've done programs for presidents of the United States and others. And I've answered consistently, pretty much, when the replica of the Vietnam Memorial Wall was here in El Paso in 2002. And it came here. It's about uh, uh, not quite the full size of the one in Washington, D.C. Have either of you been there and seen it? I have. It? You've seen it. 
and my wife and I have been there. So we went out to a park in the Northeast El Paso where they had it set up and some wonderful experiences happened. Some of my former students were there who fought in Vietnam that I'd had in class in previous years. And then something happened. Uh, I think it was the second day of the event they had it set up. My wife and I go and we're walking up and here are some Native Americans with their totems and their, 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 their uh, all the kinds of things that they were going to use for a ceremony, feathers and so on. And they saw me walking up as Uncle Sam and they motioned for me to come up to them. And I said, yes. And they said, we want you to be a part of our ceremony. We're going to have a ceremony here in front of the wall and we want you to be a part of it. I said, oh my goodness, okay. So my wife steps back and she takes the camera and takes some pictures of me standing there with these Native Americans. Now Harry, you told me before we started this taping that you're Native American, from what tribe? From the Hopi tribe. From the Hopi tribe. Okay, so here they are and they go this, through this area. And at some, one point, their medicine man comes up with a feather and he blesses me. Uncle Sam, blessings. And tears were running down my cheek because I thought about the difficulty of Native American tribes under the American government, yet Native Americans were joining or being drafted and going and fighting for the freedom in this country. How does that make you feel, Harry? It's like you said, being drafted or joining. A lot of us were, when we, went, when we enlisted, all the other service members thought we were anything but Native Americans. A lot of people have never seen Native Americans in a military uniform. Mm -hmm. They would assume that we were Hispanic, we were maybe a Filipino, or another descendant of another background. Mm -hmm. But when we said Native American, they never recognized us. But we were side by side until we, you know, until we we left as strangers over there and we came back as brothers. Yeah. But we had our we had our own faith within ourselves. But yes, there's many tribes in in the Native American here in this country. Tribes even I haven't even known. Well, the Navajos were code talkers in World War II and helped win that war yes. in, the, in the Pacific. My father is full-blooded Navajo. Mm -hmm. My mother is full-blooded Hopi. I'm registered with the Hopis. Mm -hmm. And yes, he told me that they would want to know how much ammunition they had here, bombs, to be sent over there, or what they wanted over there, and it would be in code talking. So my father, he was one of them here in Arizona you know, uh, letting them know what they wanted from overseas because they couldn't let the, the enemy find out about what type of right. munitions they needed. I want to mention one other personal note here. Um, when my wife and I were here in the 1963-64 going to school summer sessions and I came to teach at Texas Western in 65, she had a cousin whose husband was at Fort Bliss. He became a major, Dean Niffin his name. He was sent to Vietnam and he was one of the early casualties in Vietnam. I believe his name is on the very first panel of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. At the replica, uh, I went to that location and I pointed my finger where his name is and my wife took a picture. And then some of my former students were coming up and they were saying, here are my buddies on the wall. One man comes up to us and he said, let me count off, and he counted off, I believe, 11 names of his buddies on the wall. The wall is designed so that they didn't do it alphabetically, they did it by units that were killed on a certain day, or individuals killed on a certain day. So I prayed with a number of those people and posed for pictures with a number of those people. In many cases, you were drafted. Weren't you fighting for your buddies? A lot of what really put the ferocity of your own fighting was because of the guy on your right and your left. I keep hearing that. We were fighting for the United States. You were fighting for the United States, but also you get into the combat, you're fighting for your buddies that you know could die. Now that man had, uh, what do you call it, survivor's uh, guilt. Why did I live and they die? Didn't you ever ask you that question, why you saw some of your buddies die and you survived? That's, that's one of the few questions that we ever talk about, but yes, it's, it's true. Why, why him? Why can't it be me? He's got family and, and a wife, maybe, so since I wasn't married, I said, why couldn't it have been me instead? Yeah. And here I am today, after all these years, I can remember just everything that had happened. Uh -huh. You know, you trigger the word when you're saying helicopters, and when I remember the choppers we had, it just, you know, automatically, automatic thoughts that went into my mind, it was uh, bad and good, and good and bad. Right. Now, John, what about you? You're fighting for country, you're fighting for 
mother of the United States, apple pie and all these things, but you're also fighting for your buddies. You kind of get away from the family when you're over there. Uh, you're associated with people that every day. You're in the same hole with people every day. Uh, they watch your back. We watch their back. Mm -hmm. uh, and to take care of each other. You never seen camaraderie like we had the first year that I was over there. Everybody, regardless of who they were, everybody got along. We knew everybody. Uh, the second year was different. It seemed like everybody just wanted to go in their little groups and, and start to hang out and stuff like that and didn't uh, fit in with everybody. Uh, and I, I think that caused us harm in the battle that we were trying to do. Instead of being team, they were individuals, thinking yeah. about themselves mm -hmm. and individuals. Right. Uh -huh. Let's talk about mail call. Before our time is gone, was that a bright spot when you would get something from home? Oh, I see yes. a smile on your face right now. <laughs> My mother lived close to a cannery, so I didn't go for want. I got menudo, I got beef jerky, I got anything you put in the can. <laughs> Not so much the mail that you could read, but what you could eat. Well, that and the, <laughs> the letters were nice. And, uh, I tried to be cheerful in the letters that I sent back. Oh, yeah, well. you don't want her to worry, worry too much. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, I mentioned that uh, when we go up to Angel Fire over the Memorial Holiday, the book that you have here, they have a presentation that's Letters from Home. That's up in New Mexico, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and the, it's in... Uh, uh, it's a well-known uh, Vietnam Memorial yeah. uh, up there in New Mexico at Angel Fire. Yeah, Angel Fire, right. Uh, they have, uh, the, the, it's a continuous movie, and it was produced by HBO mm -hmm. uh, before they've got that. But these letters from home strike home to a lot of people when they come in there. There's a lot of tissue paper in there for a reason. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, someone that's never been, the chapel is immaculate. And if you go in there by yourself, you get a, a different outlook on things. Yeah. Now, you had a big smile come on your face when I mentioned letters from home. Uh, what brought the smile to your face when you got it? Cookies, said it's brownies, good, letters? <laughs> it's good news because it's either from your mom, your dad, your brother, sister, or someone related to you. And that's the letters I look forward to. I didn't get them every week or every two weeks, but when I got one, it, it, was, it was very nice. I remember one of my shipmates out there, he received maybe six letters a day. I don't know how he did this. And when he didn't get no letters for two days, the third day would come in maybe almost 40 letters in one mailing. Oh my goodness. You know, so I asked him, I said, how do you get all these letters? He just smiled. I don't know where he found the time to write, but we were all watching the mail come in and when he got his mail, you know, that made us feel good. Well, it's amazing now with these warriors over in Iraq and Afghanistan, they can see one another through Skype or things like that. Uh, you didn't have that kind of thing. No, we had a telephone line that would be used maybe once a month that everybody can go and talk, call home. And it was only for three or five minutes, and then they have to let the next person on there. It wasn't very long, just okay. so you can, hear your, you can hear their voice and they can hear your voice. So that was a morale booster for you in country. On, in country, describe. on certain bases. And it wasn't permanent. It was just like say once or maybe once a month or maybe once every two months. Uh -huh. Did you have, like in some cases, school children, they will write and they will send things. Did you have those experiences? I have them, they still do here. Uh -huh. uh, we go out and visit the schools here and the kids before the holidays always give their teacher the letters to give to us. Oh, okay. And we go out there uh, close to the holidays, and that's where I said Prices Karimi comes in with yeah. their delicious little snacks and, wow. and things like that. And it's amazing what these kids ask in the letters or tell you in the letter. They know more than their parents think they know. Aren't you glad now that Vietnam veterans are being recognized for their service because when the war was ending, I remember this vividly, there were many negative feelings about Vietnam veterans coming back and not being greeted and some of them being treated very rudely, very badly. And now today, the public seems to be much more saying, thank you for your service. Only in this city I've seen it more than anywhere else, not in other cities. 
I walk to the market and we're in this vest. Some people will say, thank you for your service. Uh -huh. As well as I do people in their military uniforms, I say the same thing to them. It, it puts a little warmth into their heart, because it does it to me. But this is the only city that recognizes veterans, and I'm sorry, but some of the other cities, they do not. Oh, that's so sad. Not well, like El Paso has a long history of being a military city. Right. Well, that's too bad. One of our partners is fixing to leave the commanding general out at Fort Bliss. Yeah. He invited us to every event that, that took place out there just about. We made numerous of them. Uh, change of commands and things like that. In fact, the Bull Gar Bulldog Brigade out there adopted us. Mm -hmm. Well, General Petard is the one you're referring to. Yes. Who went to Eastwood High School. And uh, Eastwood and Burgess and Irving and many others, we have a long line of people that have gone to West Point and the Naval Academy and so on, and people here that helped them to get some of those uh, opportunities to do that. And I'm sure that you support those that are trying to get into those institutions too. Well, I want to thank you for coming and telling your stories. I wish we had more time because that was a long time ago and you have a lot of wonderful memories. You get together with your associates, you have a lot of war stories, don't you? Many. Many war stories. And I heard you telling some of them the other day <laughs> at the uh, VFW Hall. And so thanks for coming today and sharing these stories thank with us. Thank you for the invite and I appreciate being able to put us out and forward where we can maybe draw some members in and the numbers that I provided there, and I'll do it again if you'd like. Okay. Well, uh, our, our, our co-producer, he's going to weave those up on the screen. He may even do it right now as I'm talking okay. to you here at the end of the program so that it's a reminder that someone needs to get in touch with you because you could help them and they could help you. Thanks. Thank you very John, much for having we, for we being do, here today. We do have coffee at this Oh, and Mr. Hopi, <laughs> Harry, we're glad well, to have you. What we missed is we get together on Saturday at the El Sarapa restaurant uh -huh. that's in between Montana and Airport Road. Bingo Plus is over there and oh, in the okay. back side of that. And we get a pretty good gathering that come over, and we pass along a lot of information there. And vets that don't go anywhere, they're welcome to come. They feed themselves, of course, right. but they can see what it's all about. Fellowship. 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 A common, common bond between you. That's bond of brothers. Band of brothers. Well, thanks for watching Perspectives El Paso. I try to bring you some interesting shows and interesting people, and these two fellows are very interesting people. Thanks for being with us. Thank I'm you. I'm Leon Blevins from Community College. Mm -hmm.